What's up, everyone, and welcome to episode 263 of Two Amazon Sellers in a Microphone, brought to you by Solozo. And uh, today we're we're really excited. We're going to be talking about how to scale to eight figures or more using hiring and SOPs, which is critical. I know Chris and I talk about this a lot. Sometimes setting up SOPs and hiring the right people can be challenging. So uh, we're going to talk about all that, and we're excited to have joining us. Josh Hadley, the CEO of Ecom Breakthrough. What's up, Josh? How are you? Doing good. How you doing, Dustin? Excited to be here. We're good. We're we're freezing up here in Kansas City right now. <laughs> it's a nice little blizzard going on, and I know it's it's hitting you down there in Texas too. Uh, That's a little right. Bit cold. You you know it's cold. Uh, you know throughout the Midwest, if it reaches all the way down to Texas. <laughs> exactly. I'm not. I wasn't prepared for this yet, but at least we'll have a, a white Christmas. So. That will be nice, but uh, thanks for coming on. I know it's um, getting ready. It's for the holiday season, and thanks for making the time to join us. And I want to just open it up to you and let you uh, give us a little bit about your your background uh, before we dive into the topics. But you know, how did you get started? What were you doing before you got into e-commerce? What made you want to get into selling on Amazon? And then we'll talk about the rest of it as we go. So you have the floor, Josh. Awesome. Yeah, so I'm I'm your typical entrepreneur story of the the kid with the candy stand on the corner of the street, you know, at a young age. So there was just something innate within me that I just loved business and entrepreneurship at a very young age, always trying to find ways to to make money. So let's fast forward to college. Get into college and uh, you know, I do my undergrad in finance. I end up doing an MBA at the University of Utah. And I end up getting a full-time job offer from American Airlines in their MBA leadership development program. So um, myself, not quite knowing exactly what I want to do in business quite yet, other than the fact that like, I know I want to run businesses. Like that's the only thing I knew mm -hmm. that I wanted to do. So I was like, all right, MBA leadership development program. That's close enough. Let's get started there. So that moved my family from Utah to Dallas. So that's what brought us to Texas originally is working there at American Airlines. And then what's funny is that my wife graduated at the same time. Um, she graduated in early childhood education. We moved to Dallas. First thing she does is like, hey, you've got a great job lined up. I don't have a job lined up, but I love this graphic design stuff. I love art. Do you mind if I just experiment and do some wedding invitations for some people? And I was like, ah, that's fine. Like, we've got time to figure it out. We don't have kids at this point. We had a dog. That's it. We're like, yeah, like, go have fun uh, for now and experiment with this new business idea. So she starts doing these designing wedding invitations for some friends. And like, her friends keep re coming back and saying, like, you did such an amazing job. Like, I want to refer you to this friend. So all of a sudden, like my wife and I are like, hey, maybe we should start a custom wedding invitation business on the side. So when I come home from work every day, I'm figuring out ways to kind of promote and sell these custom wedding invitation, you know, wedding invitation packages that we were offering. And so I would go into a lot of Facebook groups. You know, this is 2014 at the time would go into thousands of these Facebook groups and you know talk to anybody that was looking for wedding invitations and refer people to my wife so we created a whole sales process where i had like scripts written out like i knew exactly what to say in order to get somebody kind of to reserve a slot pay a deposit and get on my wife's calendar all right so that's that got us up to a point where we were we had a wait list to work with my wife for six months and at the same time, my wife was expecting our first child and we were like, there's no way we can keep this going in the future if we're planning to have a family because my wife was just working with one client after another and it just got busier and busier. And so that's when it occurred to us. It's like, all right, let's find a way to actually scale this business. So what we ended up doing is I, I was looking at, you know, just browsing Google, listening to a bunch of different podcasts and came across Amazon, right? FBA, this make millions on Amazon, right? Um, so I went through one of the courses. I don't even know whose course I purchased at the time. It wasn't the ASM courses, but went through one of the courses, learned about it. My wife designed our first product was recipe cards. And so she designed recipe cards. We threw them on Amazon. They quickly sold out. And I was like, 
oh my goodness, like <laughs> this is amazing. You didn't have to work with, with another client. I didn't have to sell somebody. Like we just put it up online and we just need to click reorder from our manufacturer at this point. So that's where we got started. That was really the beginning of 2017. Um, and now here we are 2022, five years later from full-time being on Amazon. Uh, we crossed the eight figure mark and we've grown our brand to over 1300 different SKUs. So it has been quite the journey. Wow. Why, why FBA and not Etsy? I just, it feels like this would be like the first avenue to go to. And you took a different approach, which is great. Obviously it worked out for you, but you went straight FBA. Yeah, we actually had listings up on Etsy that would drive people to the custom wedding invitation side of the business. But really, it just wasn't that big of like a lead generator for us. Um, and that's why we tested Amazon out just kind of like we tested Etsy out. And then, you know, Amazon was like fire catching fire, so to speak. So Etsy, you know, it's there for the handmade stuff, but we didn't see like the amount of volume and traffic that we saw immediately from Amazon. This, uh, this is very interesting to me. My, my wife's an artist uh, yeah. as well, and she's uh, published children's books, uh, written and illustrated children's books on KDP, uh, we've got that avenue going, but we've always talked about, you know, I've, I've been doing FBA with physical products for, you know, 10 years. And I've always talked about, there's gotta be a way to integrate this um, with, with your talent set and with what we can do with marketing and selling it. Um, so I got a question, these recipe cards, that was your first product. Did, did you get those produced overseas? Uh, or was it domestic? Or did, were you, what was the process of that? And I mean, it's still a physical product. I mean, it's just, it's probably a package of really nice designed recipe cards. But what was the logistics behind getting it to FBA? Yeah, so one of the nice parts about it is that we already had a manufacturer that was printing all of the custom wedding invitations that we were sending to them, right? So they were located here in the US. And so when we had this idea, all I needed to do is reach out to my account rep, got him on the phone. I was like, hey, I have this crazy idea. Like rather than just sending us, you know, the wedding invitations in a box and whatnot, can you shrink wrap these packages of, you know, recipe cards? We need them in sets of 50 and here's the size dimensions. We need them, you know, we need a barcode on top of them with some chipboard on the back. And he's like, yeah, that's, that's easy enough. So they kind of like retooled their process for us and just as like a test. And since then, I mean, they've been like our partner to help grow not only the wedding invitation side of the business, but they've been our partner to take us to this eight figures. And so, yeah, I mean, that's a whole big component that I love to preach is like your supplier and manufacturer is your biggest partner in your business. Um, they have helped us grow. They've helped us, you know, even warehouse our stuff when COVID hit and everybody got hit with the, you know, inventory limits. Like they've been one of our biggest partners in the business. So yeah, we didn't do anything overseas and we love it. Currently everything is manufactured in the U S for us. Yeah. I'm Besides sure recipe people. cards. What else are you, what other, I mean, 1300 SKUs, that's nothing to shake a stick at. What else do you got? Yeah. So we have anything from, you know, we do calendars um, all the way up to like stickers, baby milestone stickers, it, even magnets that we have. So really we're in, I probably want to say like 85 different like product categories wow. itself. And then from there, you know, about 20 to 30 different SKUs. Um, you know, some are more, a lot more, some are, that would probably be the average 20 to 30 SKUs for each of those product categories. So it's a lot to manage, um, but it's, it's been a fun ride and it's fun watching, you know, going into different niches and, you know, it also diversifies ourselves. You know, I know a lot of people that have, you know, hero skews and it's like, I can just place one big order with my manufacturer. And it's like, that's well and good. But if anything ever happens to that one skew, you're in trouble. We know that story really well. <laughs> <laughs> sure do. <laughs> oh, we definitely know that. Um, okay. So at, at what point, so obviously there's nothing better than making that first order. It's, it's on like a prayer and a whim and you put it on there and you're like, oh my gosh, this is a business. But at this, I love this feeling because you're like, oh my gosh, is this too good to be true? Or do I just continue to go with it? Like, I, is this a one thing time, one time thing? 
and then you just go with it and you're like, Oh my goodness, this is, and now look at you. That's a good feeling. Yes, it is. <laughs> yep. We really dabbled in it. And then I was like, all right, well, if this works, what else, you know, what else could we print, you know, designs so, on at, and go from there? At what point, um, did American airlines no longer become your <laughs> primary <laughs> concern? Yeah. So it actually, you know, I call, you know, American Airlines my venture capital, um, really to get us started. We kept, we did, you know, a million dollars on Am our first year on Amazon. So 2017, Ooh. we did a million dollars. It's like, oh, this is great. But as anybody knows, like top line numbers are not your cash flow, nor are they your net profit, right? And so real quickly, what we learned is that, wow, this, this thing is going to take a lot of capital to, you know, if we want to continue to grow. And I think that's what's interesting in, in the art and graphic design space. If you go to Etsy, I mean, good grief, like you, there are so, so much competition. Every, you know, mom that feels like she wants a side hustle, throw something up on Etsy and, you know, sells digital files and things like that. But it's just swimming with, you know, competition. Whereas with Amazon, you know, a little bit less competition just because you've got to bring hundreds of thousands of dollars to the table in order to, you know, produce products, manufacture them, ship them, all of that stuff. And so um, for us, what we've been able to do is really just grow systematically. And so it hasn't been a big push to like, oh, just launch, launch, launch. Let's take a bunch of loans out or anything like that. I We never took money from the business. We used my salary at American Airlines all the way up until uh, the fall of 2019. So the fall of 2019 is where I officially left American Airlines. And then we were like, all right, I can pull out the same salary from the business that I was making at American Airlines. So that's when we felt comfortable kind of pulling the ripcord, so to speak. But that would be like my biggest advice to many entrepreneurs. They feel like, and it could have been easy for me to, you know, day one, oh my gosh, we sold so much product on Amazon, we sold out. But to be like, to have the wherewithal to say, okay, I'm still going to need to be able to, you know, bootstrap this business, grow it further, reorder inventory. So don't quit your day job any too soon and go all in because you'll make better decisions when you're financially comfortable. And and we were, we were financially comfortable. I continued to work at American Airlines, but in the night I was hustling. You know, I would come home from work five, six o'clock, and then I would be up until 2 a.m. just grinding out, um, working on new ideas for the business. So I'm a big proponent of bootstrapping businesses and that hustle and grind mindset. I'm glad you brought that up about, you know, everyone talks about, oh, I'm a seven figure seller or an eight figure seller. When you get down to the bottom line, it's not that big of a number a lot of times, especially if you're trying to live off of it. Um, Cause that, that is a mistake that I made. I definitely quit my job a year or two too early. And that's not fun when your quote unquote salary that you pull has to fluctuate every month <laughs> based yeah. on what you, what you can do. That's a different scenario. So you definitely did that part uh, a lot smarter. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about, scaling the business um you know at, at some point obviously this couldn't be run by just two people or you, you know, or it would take too much of your time and you couldn't focus on family and everything else yep um what steps did you start implementing in terms of um like hiring and, and who who were the first tasks that you hired out yeah so one of the first things that we did, we we had a VA, <clears throat> my sister actually joined us when we were doing custom wedding invitations because we were getting so busy. And then as we transitioned to Amazon, I had her start doing like all the customer service and things like that to begin with. So the first like overseas VA that we hired probably came in, I want to say around 2019, right as we were you know, getting ready to leave American Airlines. So probably early 2019 is where we hired that first VA because my sister then needed to move up into taking over some supply chain tasks from me, right? The reordering process, making those decisions. <clears throat> I had already created an SOP that we needed to follow. 
And so I just needed my sister to kind of step in. So we hired a customer service VA, moved uh, my sister into that supply chain management position. Then from there, some of the key hires that we've made, and we've made a couple bad hires, a um, couple bad hires and mistakes that we made is we just thought like, well, and this is a whole other tangent, but we got distracted with our business thinking, hey, Amazon can shut us down at any given point in time, right? That's every Amazon seller's fear. And so we're like, hey, look at this opportunity on Etsy where people are just selling the digital files. Like, imagine that. Like, we wouldn't have cash flow issues. You just create the digital file, sell the PDF. So we got distracted in the business and we spent so much time and effort creating all these digital files, trying to master Etsy. Um, we hired two, if you can believe this, two full time graphic designers, okay, to help us produce more content not for Amazon, but for Etsy. And Etsy at the time was making us maybe a hundred grand. Whereas again, Amazon was at this point, 2019, I think we were doing about 6 million or so. And it's like, we put all of our eggs in this basket of like, oh, let's go diversify ourselves. And so we hired two full-time graphic designers that ended up not working out or like, oh, that was a mistake. And then we also hired a marketing manager that was specifically there to help grow the Etsy side of the business where it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why are we putting so much emphasis on something that isn't really picking up traction quickly like Amazon did for us? So one lesson, you know, to communicate to the listeners is just, I would encourage you to continue doubling down on the things that are working in your business rather than running away or being scared, you know, because we've never implemented black hat tactics in our business. We've always been white hat. So like, what were we scared of on Amazon, right? That's like, oh, we could wake up one morning and our account suspended. It had we not kind of spent, we actually spent probably like two years trying to like build this other Etsy side of the business. Had we not spent so much time and effort there, I would argue we probably would have hate, hit eight figures in that 2019, 2020 timeframe. Um, so that, that, that's one lesson learned there, but it really all came to fruition. This is kind of where we started building out our team. Currently we have over 20 team members. This all started when COVID hit us right in front of the face. Mm. So March comes along, we were humming along. Like I said, we did 6 million in 2019. Um, 2020 comes along, we're crushing it during January and February and we had a lot of party supplies. Like, had you talked to me back in like early 2020, I would have said, yeah, we have a, you know, party stationary brand. Mm. Well, as everybody knows, COVID was not very, uh, very friendly to parties. And so we watched sales go from, you know, we were doing a thousand plus orders a day to like, we were down to maybe a hundred orders a day if we were lucky. Right. So like overnight losing 90% of the business, we're like, Oh crap. So that's when we started to say, okay, let's scale this thing back. Like, let's figure out like, what is our true business? Like, what are we trying to do here? And so that's when we said, that, that's when we started to lay off people. And we said, wait, why are we, we were trying to start a blog at the time. We had somebody that was running a blog. We had people that were working on, you know, creating designs for Etsy. We're like, hold on, that's making us little to no money in terms of the amount of effort. Amazon's still there. It's struggling by right now, but I think there's some light at the end of the tunnel. So we scaled back our team at that point. And then we said, we're all in on Amazon. Let's double down on Amazon. Let's pivot. Let's try to find something that will work in today's environment. And so we got into, you know, school supplies. Obviously, homeschool was huge at the time. And so we got into some school supplies that started to do very well for us. And we started to see some light at the end of the tunnel. But at that point, one of the first things that we did, which was, you know, probably should have been our first hire back in 2018, 2019, was we hired a project manager. And so the project manager finally was able to create some, you know, process out of the chaos of my wild ideas and my wife being able to produce those ideas and get them out to the market, right? So 
project manager. Uh, we brought on an R and D manager uh, that helped, you know, do all the research and development to find new products for us. Um, from there, we continued. We you know, fa found an actual full time supply chain manager, somebody that just manages our Amazon account help, so on and so forth. So the list goes on and on. But that's kind of the story of like 2020 is where we really started to like scale the business by creating SOPs and hiring people to fill those roles. So what I really want to know is, were you paying your sister? <laughs> I was, I was paying my sister. She is one, she has state, she has seen it all through this business. So she's, she's still here with us today, fortunately. <laughs> and, and then you talked about project manager. What, what does that, um, what's that link look like? Like you get an idea, go to project mm -hmm. manager, they, you know, blueprint it out and all that kind of stuff. What's that look like when you talk, when you talk to project manager? Yeah, we had, you know, at the time I had also been re reading the book, you know, E-Myth is one of, you know, one of the typical ones that everybody talks Good about. Book. But I realized that it's like, I am the one who drives the majority of this business. I go and I find the ideas. I have to try to coordinate, hey, this, this is the product specifications, you know, communicating with the, the manufacturer and trying to communicate to my wife, this is the opportunity. What this project manager allowed me to do was to step back and say, all right, let's create some organization from your wild ideas. All right, Josh, where does this all begin? Like before we get to launching a product on Amazon, where does this start? Well, it all starts when I'm, I browse on Amazon, I'm looking at for this criteria, I'm looking at that criteria um, <clears throat> and this is, this is where these are the type of product opportunities that I think are good for our business to, to get involved in. So that's where we first started. And then we went, okay, then what? Well, then I, you know, provide the specifications to my wife who does some, you know, design research, decides the designs that she wants to create. Okay. Then what? Well, then we have to go, you know, send this to the manufacturer and we need to get some samples. And then we place the full order. And while we're waiting for the full order to come through, we need to go through and we need to create a title. But before we create a title, we need to do keyword research, right? So it went on and on. And so we now have a full fledged like process that, you know, um, really from idea all the way to launching the product, like we have processes that talk about everything, how we do our keyword research, how we create our titles, how we create the bullets, how we create the images, um, what promotions we're running, how do we price the product when we launch. And that way, all I need to do is to coordinate and hire the right team members to go execute on those individual tasks. I'm a big believer that you don't actually own a business until you can start just working on your business, right? Um, if I am so instrumental to the business that like, the business is not moving forward while I'm on vacation or heaven forbid I'm sick or anything like that. That's not a real business. And any, any event can, you know, trigger a, a whole downward spiral in your business. So, uh, that's what I worked on primarily with our project manager. And, and it took a long time, not to say it's completely perfect right now. There's always things we're working on to become more efficient, but man, it's taken a huge load off my shoulders. And even if I were to go get hit by a bus today, I would argue that we have the team members and the processes in place that like they could keep the business moving forward um, today. So that's what, you know, the project manager has been a huge linchpin in documenting and creating those processes for the business. The hires that you're making other than your, your sister, are they uh, overseas? Are they virtual assistants, full-time employees? Are they in your city? What is that? And where are like? you finding them? Yeah. Where are you finding them? Yeah. Yeah. So I actually, I would argue have one of the best hiring processes to find overseas, like management level talent overseas. And so when we, like our project manager, she came from IBM. She's not your typical VA that you go on to Upwork and you're like, I just need a virtual assistant. Like she's not a virtual assistant. She is a project manager and was a project manager at, you know, a large corporation before, right? But she's located in the Philippines. 
same thing with our R&D manager that we hired. He wasn't just a VA that I taught our process to. He was one of like, he was doing like supply chain um, stuff for a, a large US organization slips my mind right now. But he was working there in the Philippines. Um, they actually were trying to recruit him to move to the US. Um, and they had kind of like management positions they wanted him to take. And so we for we were fortunate to be able to steal him away. And uh, he wanted to stay there in the Philippines, which was great. Um, so yeah, management level staff is what I'm looking for. So we have a really good process. Um, I have a whole seven step process. I recorded it. I, I have a, my own podcast, Ecom Breakthrough, um, where I walk through, and this could be a whole other hour long conversation of going through and how to find management level staff overseas. Um, and so most of our those 20 team members are all there in the Philippines. And then we recently, just a couple months ago, actually hired a VP of operations He's located in Austin, Texas. Um, he His background is he worked at Procter & Gamble for five years, then helped take a uh, CPG firm or small company from 10 million to 50 million. So that's exactly where we're at. And I was like, come on board with us because that's where we're going. Um, so being able to bring in his experience and expertise now has been huge, but it's taken us getting the business to this point to where I have been able to pay somebody like him that has a lot of capabilities that can help be an extra you know hand in the business to really scale it to the next level when you when you hire and you scale up your business what are some things you look for when making that like final decision on when to hire them like there's a lot of noise out there there's a lot of places you can find bas how do you go through those and figure out okay this is the right one are you giving them like a task to do at the very beginning to weed them out is your proposal like extremely long and elaborate that you weed out all the ones that are just lazy and don't want to do it? Like what's, what's kind of going into that a little bit? Yeah. Well, first off, I, th I think it really all starts with being able to identify what is the hire you need to make. Right. And I think that's where people get caught up. They hear me talk about, Oh, I have a project manager. Oh, well, surely I need a project manager. Um, or they hear me talk about an R&D manager and they're like, oh, I need an R&D manager. Okay, well, you need to understand your business. And one of the best things that I encourage people to do is to do a time study, right? Where you are documenting everything you do in 15 minute increments for an entire week. I know it's tedious, but if you are seriously writing everything down that you do in 15 minute increments, and then you take a step back to go and analyze what you were doing in those 15 minute increments, you're going to quickly understand where you're spending most of your time. So why did we hire a project manager to begin with? And then why did we immediately hire an R&D manager? Well, real quickly, I found that without the project manager, I was the one project managing everything in the business. I had to come up with the ideas. I had to send them to my wife and I had to follow up and say, where are these at? communicate that over to the supplier, get everything started on Amazon, right? I was like, wow, I am coordinating all of this. So we hired the project manager. Then again, kind of that conversation I had with our project manager as we walked through the process, I realized one of the biggest things that I'm doing for the business is coming up with new product ideas. And so I said, wow, if I could offload literally 50% of my time to somebody else, Imagine all the other things I would be able to work on in the business. So that's why we then hired an R&D manager, right? So that's been the process of, of our evolution is me doing time studies and my wife and us saying, okay, here are all the things that we're doing. When it gets to the point where it makes sense to like, it could be a part-time, whether it's 10, 20 hours a week, but we know we could scale up faster if we hired somebody to do that. That's when we kind of make that hiring decision. Um, but going back to your question, Chris, how, what is kind of the process that we go through to, you know, sift through all yeah. the many applicants, um, that, that go through our hiring process. So one of the things that we do is, you know, a, a lot of people go to websites like Fiverr or they go to Upwork and they just create a job post and then they just hope and pray that people either apply, um, 
and they just see what applicants that they can get, right? We take, you know, I'm a big sales guy, so I I do not love to just sit around. I'm always very proactive. So one thing that we do is immediately after we create a job post, we are reaching out to candidates. Um, and that's one thing that not many people do because we'll get comments on Upwork all the time because you can invite people to your job posts on Upwork, right? So you we put a job post on Upwork and then we invite people, literally probably like a thousand to two thousand people at least for every single um, job listing that we have. What are you looking at right there when you when you invite them? What are some things that stand out that like if you just see that one phrase, you're like, "Yep, invite." Like I mean, that, a thousand's a lot, so I'm like, "There's yep. got to be something." You're looking at the title or quickly in their portfolio to invite them. Yeah, so really, it's just their title to begin with, and then I'm we are not spending time looking at their resume or anything like that. Um, all we're doing is we're just simply inviting everybody. It's simply a numbers game. And then I'll kind of walk you through the process. So you invite as many people as you can because you want the top of the funnel to be getting as many people as you can. Ideally, when you have a job post, you want at least a thousand applicants um, to get somebody like you're going to find some really good people if you're getting a thousand applicants. Okay. So we'll have about a thousand people typically apply for any particular role. From there, the first step before we do anything else, before I interview, before I even look at their resume or anything, we send them an assessment to take. We call it a personality assessment. And yeah, it does tell about tell us about their personality. But most importantly, through that process, um, it gives them kind of an IQ score, so to speak. The one that I use, it's called Criteria Corp. So I'm not an affiliate. You could just go to CriteriaCorp.com. Uh, but you don't have to pay per assessment. And that's why I love them so much. So I ha I send it out to all thousand of these people. And then it's going to, and it goes through like their English speaking skills, typing, spelling, math, like just basic skills, right? And it's going to spit out a score. And what they argue is that the higher that score, it's correlated to job success. And I found that to be relatively true. And so... Anyways, we have our criteria set that anybody that scores less than 60, they're off the list, right? So we'll weed out candidates. We'll go from 1,000 candidates down to 100 candidates um, real quick. It, it genuinely is about like 90% of the people um, get thrown away just without me even having to do anything. Then we take those 100 candidates and then we send them through, we send them a test project, okay? So this is a full blown like, this is what you will be working on. Um, typically, it's kind of like fictional. It's made up to an extent, right? Like it's not sharing our specific business numbers or whatever. Um, but like a good example is like for a graphic design assistant that we needed to hire recently. We had them create the Amazon listing images that we needed for a particular product. We said, here's the files that you'll need. Um, here's the brand guidelines. And here's what we're looking for. Here's the copy to use, right? Um, this is due one week from today. Have at it, right? And then from there, you will get from 100 candidates down to about, uh, typically our take rate is anywhere from about 30 to 50% sometimes where people will actually do the test project. And you're always going to get people that are like, oh, how dare you ask me to, do anything for you without a contract in place. I'm not doing free work for you, blah, blah, blah. Like you'll get that a, a handful of times. But here's what I, I go back to. When I interviewed to go work at American Airlines, they had me do a test project. And it was a two hour test project. And it was timed. Somebody called me and said, you can start now. Here's the website link, go at it. And then I had to finish it in that two hour time period. And that was it, right? So for me, and it was an actual like business problem at American Airlines. How would I resolve this capacity issue? And if these were things going on in the business, right? Make the seats bigger. That's what I would do. <laughs> <laughs> Add more space. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so to me, it's like, look, if Fortune 500 companies are doing this, why in the world would I be scared to hesitate right. to reach out and tell people to do a test project? And so anyways, from there, we'll have 30 to 50 people, you know, that will actually do the test project. 
that's the first time that I'll actually start looking at people's stuff. And I'm looking at the, the test project. And typically real quick, and here's kind of one little side note on that test project. I'll have people record a five minute loom video. And I say, walk me through what you did in your test project. Yeah. And again, this is a real quick, I can pull up that video. Sometimes I've got 30 minute videos in media. I'm like trash, right? Like, it's like, I asked you to record a five minute loom video. Five can, minute video. <laughs> I don't have time to do 30 times 30, right? And I also want to know that you, you can follow directions, but you can also like concisely articulate whatever I've asked you to do, right? Five minutes is tough um, for some of our projects, but we ask that and then people will send in our responses. And so I'll go through it. And then from there, what we'll do is we'll move into like a group interview. So I'll take, you know, people in chunks of five. Typically we'll have like five out of the 30 to 50 people, anywhere from five to like 10 people that are like, okay, I, I want to talk to these people. Now I'll interview them. We group interview people in sets of five. Um, we found that to be the best. And one of our favorite questions that I ask in our group interview is at the very end, after we've spent an hour with each other, I say, all right, who would you hire from this interview? And you can't choose yourself. So mm. super oh, awkward nice. conversation, but time, every single time we've asked this question, everybody always chooses the person who we end up hiring. Like it is, hey, but you already have an idea. Like after that hour, you have an idea who you're going to hire. You're just trying to get feedback from generally. The other ones. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, generally, but you want to put people on the spot too and see how they act under pressure and like awkward situations, right? Like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, anyways, and then we'll move on to like individual interviews. And really, during the individual interview, what I'm looking for one on one interviews with people is do they have a pattern of success everywhere that they've gone? Have they been promoted quickly? Or have they worked on big projects that's made a big impact in the business? Or are they the type of person that they're always shifting from job to job to job, right? That's your red flag. Um, but you're looking for like a pattern of, of success. And so we'll go through their career history and I get down into the details with them. One of my favorite questions that we ask in the individual interviews is as we go through each job, I say, who is, who is your manager at this job? And then they'll say, Oh, it was John. No, what's his full name? Oh, John. So-and-so. Okay. I'm going to reach out to John. We like to do reference checks. When I ask John, I'm going to ask him to rate your performance on a scale of one to 10. What is John going to say? What rating will John give you? So it's not, what did your, it wasn't, what do you think your manager will say? Or sorry, it's not, what do you think your manager thought about you? It is, what is your manager going to say? And I'm not asking the question of, what is your biggest weakness? I ask, what is your manager going to say is an area of improvement for yourself? And then what is your manager going to say was your area, your greatest strength that you brought to the organization? So all of a sudden it gives them that truth serum, right? That mm -hmm. they can't, they, if they're going to BS you, well, you're going to follow up with that reference check. And if they're BSing you, then they're off the list already, right? So you're going to get very like honest responses from that. So you're looking for things. Those are some of my favorite questions to ask. And then we'll shoot off emails for those reference checks. As long as everything comes back, you know, we'll go ahead and extend an offer to people. So that is the quick nuts and bolts. I mean, I could dive into each of those. That's really good. Detail, but Ooh. that's that, the quick that's really process. What's the time frame? Like job post to hire date? Like, does that usually take a month? About a month. Days? Yeah, um, four to six weeks. It's a good process. That is a very good process. I will be. I learned some things. Off with, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. you said you think you have one of the best hiring processes, and I think you're right. That's very thorough. <laughs> and are you doing all this? Like, this is what you do now is like the hiring? Yeah, I I think that one of my, you know, greatest skills is being able to identify good talent, right? And I think that for any CEO, one of your, any CEOs, your most important job is to Make sure the business is funded with cash, right? To make sure it can continue to operate. And then secondly, 
getting the right people on the bus and in the right seats, right? Those are your two most important jobs for any CEO. And so that's all I spend my time doing is making sure that I'm, I'm going through and I'm trying to identify amazing A-level talent that can take our business to the next level. So I'm not working in the business. I have A, a players, you know, I love it. it. You know, I'm a big sports fan. So I see it as like I'm the general manager and I'm looking at all these different chess pieces of players that I can bring on to my team. So I'm, I'm looking for the Michael Jordans, right? I'm looking for the Kobe's. I'm looking for the Shaq's that we can build our all-star team. You might have so a what, new business here called Have the Hires. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say <laughs> Have the Hiring.com. Yeah. What, so now that you are working on your business and not in your business on a day to day basis, what does a day in the life of Josh look like? Oh, man. I mean, still, it, I love to say, I would love to say, oh, I just kind of sit around and I look at reports and I just watch the cash flow in, right? That's, that's not the truth. Um, honestly, I'm still involved in a lot of the decisions that are getting made, but it's more focused on how do we perfect the process, right? So I'm still going to sit in on a lot of our R and D meetings to, as we discuss new product opportunities to share experience. And every single time we're consistently refining the process. Um, same thing with supply chain. Um, but that's why we hired this VP of operations. Like he's coming in and having worked at Procter and Gamble, he's like, all right, that's cute that you guys built this up to this point with these spreadsheets. He's like, it's time, it's time to like build some real stuff. He's like, you have good processes to do what you're doing now. That's fine. But if you're going to go to 50 million and start getting into retail and, and grow from there, he's like, we've got to take this up another level. Um, so really, you know, day to day life, what does it look like? Number one, I've got the podcast, which is one of my favorite things that I'm doing. Um, then from there, I'm in a lot of meetings, um, but meetings just to provide feedback as to how we can make improvements to the process. Um, and then, you know, coordinating with my manager. So my Monday is just all meetings and we, we call it our 411 meeting where we coordinate all the priorities and things that need to happen throughout the week, right? And so I'm communicating with each of my, like the leadership team members to say, all right, what are you working on? And then we have a big, we call it our, our level 10 meeting, right? Comes from the EOS model that we do on Wednesdays. And that's a 90 minute meeting where our, all of our leadership team gets together. We talk about the issues in the business, talk about the the vision where we're going and go through our our financial reports last week's sales numbers and trying to identify and dig up issues in the business so really that's that's kind of what my day-to-day -day looks like is overseeing um and more kind of managing you know the next thing i need to do is i need to move into that chairman position right or sitting on the board of directors and finding a ceo right that's much easier said than done. We've still got probably a year or two before we get to that point. But that is the next stage is like, how do I get the, remove the CEO title from me and hire somebody? And maybe it's one of our current leaders right now that we, we can promote. And, but that's honestly like, it goes back to like, as I'm looking at management level staff, I'm asking and I'm looking at them three to five years down the road. And I say, is this person capable enough to grow into a VP or a C-level role for the business? And if so, yeah, let's let's bring them on. Is is retail and all that on the on the playbook? Is that the goal for the next coming years? Yeah, it is. Yeah, getting into retail. Um, we've talked with a lot of aggregators. Um, we've talked with you know some private um, private equity companies, and man, our it, the re reason why retail is perfect for our business is because many of those same retailers are our competitors on Amazon. We're just running circles around them all day long. Um, so getting our products on Amazon or our best sellers on Amazon into the retail store shelves uh, would just be opening up a whole other side of the business. Now, much easier said than done. That's a whole other business model. I don't uh, claim to have any experience or expertise there. 
Um, but it is something that I see a huge opportunity for our business to continue to grow. When you hit a certain number, are they coming to you as far as like, you know, VP, like account with people that want to invest and you know, uh, aggregators, are they coming to you and saying, Hey, I want to get involved somehow? Are you asking, like, are people reaching out to us to acquire us or yeah, are, like, are, are people are, I don't know. I don't, I'm not obviously in this process yet, but are like your numbers are going so crazy. Are you starting to get hit up by all these venture capitalist people that are like, Hey, I want to invest. I see what you're doing, wherever it be. I want to get involved somehow. Yeah. Primarily it's been more on the aggregator side of things up until this point, we haven't yet even gone to market or anything or really gotten our name out there for private equity and venture capital firms. Um, but one of the things, you know, one of the things that we will do is getting on the Inc. 5000 list, right? I hear that once you get your name on that Inc. 5000 list and you get it there a couple years in a row, that's where I hear you get a lot of private equity, venture capital firms that do proactively reach out to you. So that's something that we'll be working on for 2023. You're at a good stage. And this is something I've thought about just like willy nilly at some point, why not just go acquire your competition and just take them? You know, yeah. Just... I I am a big fan of acquisition. So Roland Frazier, if many of you know him, he's a uh, part of the digital marketing crew uh, or digital marketer um, with Ryan Dice, Perry Belcher, all those guys, they had the war room mastermind that has since retired. But um, anyways, I had him on the podcast and he is a big proponent of um, acquisitions and no money out of pocket acquisitions. And he has a whole acquisition strategy of how he goes, you know, if you want to double your business, go acquire another brand, your competitor that's doing the similar amount of revenue and bam, you've just doubled your business overnight, right? Now it's much easier said than done. Um, but yes, acquisitions, um, is on my roadmap. Probably one of the first acquisitions that I would want to make would be a media um, asset. So, and, and this would be partnering with a blog or an influencer, seeing how the performance goes for our products on those. And if a blog like starts getting a lot of traction for our products, that's when I would start opening up those conversations to say like, hey, why don't we uh, acquire your blog and let's turn everything on this blog into just sales pages for our products, right? It's a I good love story. It. This is all good. This is all this been is, good. I was gonna say we we're gonna we'll get you back on. We we could <laughs> spend an hour on any one of those uh things. Uh yes we could what a, what a journey man. Uh it's it's super exciting. It's I know everyone listening they've got to be getting a ton of value out of this conversation. I know I have I know Chris has uh just even in your your hiring process which is amazing. Um but I know, also know a lot of people are listening and they're like, I want to, I want to listen to Josh more. Uh, and you've got your podcast. So let, let everyone know um, about your podcast and where they can find it so they can tune in for more info from you. Yeah. So you can check. It's called Ecom Breakthrough. It's Ecom with two M's, Ecom Breakthrough. And it's on all the, you know, standard uh, podcast publishing networks out there. And then we have the same website, ecombreakthrough.com. You can listen to it there and we've got the YouTube channel as well. Uh, but the purpose of the podcast is to share specific strategies and tactics to help grow your brand from seven figures to eight figures and beyond. So it's not really meant for newbies or this is how you find your first product on Amazon. This mm -hmm. is how you, you know, go find something on Alibaba. Like this is for people that have already created a successful business but they know that there's more meat on the bones. Similar to myself, I knew that our brand has a lot more uh, run rate to it, right? Like I see our brand being a hundred million dollar brand. I know it, I see it, I have it in my mind and, and it's just getting to that point, right? So it's meant for those you know business owners that are like, I know my brand has a lot of potential, but there are things that I need to unlock in my business, right? I need to unlock SOPs or I need to unlock some mindset shifts. Those are the things that I had to go through um, and the mistakes. So we share the mistakes that I made. Um, we bring on, you know, other successful people that have scaled to eight figures and beyond. And 
we sum up every episode by talking about what are three actionable takeaways that you can implement in your business today to help get you closer to that eight figure mark. So well, I'm a, just a big fan of like sharing actionable content, not just fluffy, you know, stories of like, oh, that's incredible that that guy did such amazing stuff. It's like nuts and bolts. This is what you can do today. Yeah, your last oh, episode you did with uh, Matt over at Right Side Up. I listened to that one. That was that was a really good one. So if people listening, if you want marketing hacks or marketing tactics, uh, the ultimate Amazon product launch that Josh just did, uh, that podcast episode was really good. That's awesome. Cool. Well, Josh, thanks so much for joining us, taking time out of your day to uh, to share that info and your story. We really appreciate it. Uh, everyone go check out his podcast, Ecom Breakthrough, and we'll get you back on soon. So thanks again, Josh. We really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me.